If you can turn to question and answer 45 of the Catechism, I will read the question of all of us can respond together with the answer. A very appropriate question for Easter Sunday. Question 45, how does Christ's resurrection benefit us? First, by his resurrection he has overcome death so that he might make us share in the righteousness he obtained for us by his death. Second, by his power we too are already raised to a new life. Third, Christ's resurrection is a sure pledge to us of our blessed resurrection. Our scripture reading comes from John chapter 20. John chapter 20. We'll be reading the first nine verses of John chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we read this simple account of your resurrection. And may we all end up like John, if we aren't already that we believe, believe that you have risen, risen indeed. So open our hearts, let us have attentive minds and bless me as your servant to proclaim your word faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Congregation of Jesus Christ, early Easter morning, there was a foot race. One of only two foot races in the Bible. Do you remember the first foot race we are told about? David's men, two of them, went running to David to tell him the result of the battle against Absalom and Absalom's army of rebellion. That was the first foot race. Here's the second one in our Bible reading. Peter against John. And I want to bring up three points as you find them in your 
sermon outline, first the starting line, second the race, and third the victor circle. The starting line. Easter's foot race started because of Mary, Mary Magdalene. Early on Easter morning, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. How early? It was still dark. John doesn't mention anyone else, but the other Gospels tell us that Mary did not start out alone. According to Matthew 28, the other Mary went with her. Luke's Gospel tells us about a bunch of other women. Maybe Mary Magdalene was in a hurry. Maybe the other Mary was delayed. Maybe the other women fell behind. But for whatever reason, Mary Magdalene is the only one mentioned by John. And she comes to the tomb. And what does she see? Now, it's mistakenly said that Mary was a witness, the first witness to the resurrection. That's not accurate. We're not paying careful attention to Scripture when we say that or think that. Because no one saw the resurrection. Nor could anyone see the resurrection. Because it is a miracle. A creative miracle. A supernatural act like all the other miracles of God. And not a single Bible writer tries to explain the details the medical science, the anatomy, the physiology of the resurrection of a dead body coming back to life. It's an act of power, a miraculous act of power. So no, Mary did not witness the resurrection. All that she and anyone else actually sees is the result. Ultimately, all that they actually see is the result, the resurrected Lord Jesus in the flesh. And if we think about it, that's all that anyone needs to see. Nothing else is necessary, nothing else was necessary, but to see Jesus himself. So Mary comes to the tomb. And what does she see? One thing, that the stone has been removed from the entrance. A big mass of stone, guarded by soldiers, sealed with the seal of the Roman emperor, saying, don't touch, don't move, off limits, keep out. And Mary has one thought when she sees that the stone has been moved. Did she think to herself, the Lord has risen, he has risen indeed? No. Did she think, wow, he has risen as he said? No. Does she think, he is the Messiah, he is the Son of God, he is the Christ? No. Does she confess faith in the risen Lord? No. She's got one thought. Someone has taken the Lord. Actually, his body. Now let me put you in Mary's shoes, or maybe I should say Mary's sandals by listing two recent events. I read in the news of something that happened at a Connecticut cemetery. Decades old remains of people were stolen from a grave and replaced with two dead chickens. 
And in Chicago, it was revealed that a cemetery tried to make extra money. They would empty the old graves and resell the plots. And people become mad and horrified and angry about places like, or things like that because the grave is supposed to be the final resting place of our loved ones. And for their remains to be treated with such disrespect makes people sick and angry. How Mary felt or thought, but I think it's safe to probably assume that. That she was sick and angry and upset and worried when she saw that stone rolled away. And what happened? Did Mary look into the tomb or go into the tomb to see for herself the desecration of Jesus' body? Did she peek around the corner to see if Jesus' body was gone? No. She turned around and went running. She didn't look. She went running running to the disciples, running to Peter, and running to John. And she gets to them, panting for air, we can assume, and gasps out to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. I don't know about you, but I have questions for Mary. Mary? How do you know the tomb is empty? You didn't look inside. How do you know someone has taken his body? You didn't look inside. And who is the they you are talking about? They have taken the Lord. We don't know where they have laid him. Who are they? The leaders of the people who hated Jesus? The soldiers? Grave, 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 grave. Oh, Jesus? Who are they? When it comes right down to it, we're being told something really, really disappointing about Mary. She did not expect a resurrection. She is assuming Jesus is still dead. She saw him die on the cross. She saw his body put in the grave. She did not expect Jesus to rise from the dead. Resurrection is not on her mind, not at all. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. He is dead. He remains dead. And Mary, of course, is not alone. All the other disciples and apostles are thinking the exact same thing, none of them expecting a resurrection. And an irony of all ironies, you know who did expect a resurrection? The Jewish leaders. They knew the story of the daughter of Jairus, Remember, he was a leader of the synagogue. And Jesus raised his daughter from the dead. And a widow. She had one son, an only son. And he died. And Jesus raised him. And Lazarus from Bethany, just a few miles outside of Jerusalem. And all of the Jewish leaders knew about Lazarus, and they hated Lazarus, and they wanted to kill Lazarus together with Jesus. The Jewish leaders, they expected some attempt at resurrection, a concocted story or something. Or maybe the actual worst thing happening, that he actually does arise. 
So they put a guard at the tomb. Got the Romans to do that and do agree to that. We're going to seal them in there, lock them in there, and keep them in there. So we see Mary, she did not expect the greatest and most wonderful and most astounding and most important event in history that Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. Mary did not expect the greatest expression of the power of God, what we know to be the cornerstone of the gospel promises. Mary expects none of this. They have taken his body. And we don't know where they have put him. Now what was Peter's and John's response? Basically, we need to see for ourselves. We need to look over the grave. And so Mary's news starts off that foot race. And that's our second point. Off they went, running. It was like the starter's pistol, that news from Mary. It was like someone had said, and I have learned to say this properly. You don't say on your mark. You're supposed to say on your marks. Right, Lisa? On your marks, get set, go. And off they go, running. Easter's foot race. And why do I call it a foot race? Weren't they just running together? What are we told? Verse 4, the other disciple outran Peter. What are we told? Verse 6, Peter arrived following him. Two times, two times we are told this other disciple reached the tomb first. Now John is writing this. He's writing this about himself. What's his point? I reached the tomb first. I outran Peter. So it wasn't just a jog in the park. It wasn't just a friendly competition. It was an all-out, desperate, first-century race. You know, when I am preaching on events or stories like this, I go to Google Pictures, and I type in the Bible reading. And then up comes in this instance, hundreds of pictures. And I looked at those pictures, paintings from the masters. And I think most of them, not all of them, but most of them picked up the intent here. Peter and John trying to outrace each other. The pain, the agony. The strenuous effort is written all over their faces as they're running. Now, as with Mary, I have a bunch of questions. They're running all out, flat out against each other, and I wonder, well, where are they getting the energy from? Don't forget how the week started, Palm Sunday, the euphoria of Palm Sunday, the excitement. I doubt if they slept much that first night. And then comes the Last Supper, the news, someone is going to betray me. That kept them awake. And then they saw the shock of Jesus' arrest. Remember, they were in the garden. They were so tired, they fell asleep. They couldn't stay awake and pray with Jesus. They were tired. And then all the whole night in the high priest's courtyard. And now they're at the cross, and then they went to the grave, and they're tired. And yet they're running. Oh, and Peter, how well do you think he slept after denying Jesus three times? And the rooster crows, and Jesus looks at him.
And some more questions. What was going through their minds as they tried to outrun each other to get to the tomb? Do they take Mary at her word? Someone has taken him. And are they, are they angry and outraged? Are they thinking, wow, bad stuff happened to him while he was alive and even after he is dead, it's still happening? Or is something niggling the corner of their mind? Past events and past sayings, are they going through their mind? Are they calling back to memory what Jesus said? Destroy this temple. I will raise it again in three days. And they knew Jesus was talking about his body. Or what I mentioned, Good Friday. Mark 8, 31, 9, 31, 10, 32. The Son of Man must be killed and after three days be raised again. Are they thinking that? Are they thinking about the miracles that they have witnessed? Wow, there's something very unusual, something special, something powerful about this Jesus. He changed water into wine. He called Lazarus out of the tomb. And he had to call him by name. Do you remember that? He had to say Lazarus. He didn't just say come out of the tomb or everyone would have come out of the tomb. He called Lazarus. He raised the widow of Nain's son, as I mentioned, the daughter of Jairus, fed the people in the wilderness, expelled demons, restored health. Are they thinking that? He's the Christ, the son of the living God. You know, we're never going to know the answer to these questions. But this we know, they raced for the tomb, they raced against each other, and John won the race. And what did he do? Did he go into the tomb? No. But he did take a peek from the outside and saw the linen cloths lying there. And then Peter came in, and Peter, he's bolder than John. He went straight into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there in the face cloth. Now let me tell you about burial practices back then. It was the Egyptians who embalmed people, but not people in Palestine or Canaan, and certainly not the Jews and certainly not the followers of Jesus. They would take cloths, one layer of cloth, spices, another layer of cloth, spices, another layer, spices, another layer, spices. We're told 100 pounds of cloth and spices. Why? to cover up the stench of a dead and decaying body. And the head, it would be wrapped also with cloth and spices. And they come to the tomb. They come inside of the tomb. Peter first and then John, and they saw those linen cloths lying there. It couldn't have been a grave robbery. What criminal would be dumb enough to try to unwrap all that cloth and spices? No. And expose themselves to the smell. Something else happened. Well, what? We know. I don't know if they did yet. 
In fact, I don't think they did. A resurrection happened. He came. He rose. He went through the cloths and the spices. His body was no longer in there. And the cloths collapsed. They laid there. Empty. A resurrection. And that brings us to our third point, the victor circle. John won the race. He outran Peter. John stood in the victor circle. But not because he outran Peter. Not because he beat Peter to the tomb. Not because he was the first to peek into the tomb. John won the race. Why? Because he was the first to believe. What does scripture say? He saw and believed. The first to believe the greatest and most important event of human history. The first to believe Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. What I'm telling you is that John is special among all the early believers. He's the first to believe Jesus has risen, as he said. And he's the only one of the first believers to believe before he saw the risen Lord. Think of everyone else. The travelers on the Emmaus Road, when did they believe? After they saw Jesus in the flesh. And Mary, when did she believe? After her encounter with what she thought at first was the gardener. And Thomas and Peter and all the rest, when did they believe? when Jesus appeared before them in the upper room. But John, John, he saw the empty grave. He didn't see Jesus. He saw the empty grave, and he believed Jesus is alive. You know what John had? Before I answer the question, let me remind you again, I have a cycling friend I ride with. His name is Rod. and Every Saturday, he asks me two questions when we go riding. Number one, how's the preaching business? Number two, what are you preaching on? And I always give him both barrels. And then he starts asking questions, and he listened to what I was going to be preaching on right now. And he said, you know what John had? The question that I asked you. He discerned it rightly. John had faith. Now we've been looking at the heroes of faith, remember, in Hebrews 11, and Hebrews 11, 1 tells us what is faith. What is faith? Faith believes what is not seen. Faith takes God at his word. That's John. John had faith. The first to have faith that Jesus is alive, that Jesus has risen, that Easter's resurrection has happened. Now let me ask about you and me. Do we stand in the victor's circle? Now, of course, unlike Mary and Peter and Thomas and all the, us, all the rest, we don't have the privilege of an encounter with the living Lord. And I can't help but think here of what Jesus said to Thomas. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet 
have believed. Blessed are those, in other words, who have faith. We don't see. We've never seen the risen Lord face to face in the flesh. Nor will we until he comes again. We are called to have faith. And when we have faith, Jesus says we are blessed. In what way? We read this morning from question and answer 45 of the Hutterberg Catechism based upon the teachings of Scripture. And the Catechism asks, what are the benefits, or in other words, what are the blessings of the resurrection of Jesus, of believing, of having faith that he arose? Remember the first blessing? We share in Christ's righteousness. Now, on Good Friday, something got taken away from us. Our guilt. Our shame. But something needs to take its place. With the guilt and the shame gone, we are what? We are empty vessels. Something needs to take its place. And what is it that takes its place? On Easter Sunday, we, because of Easter Sunday, we are filled with the righteousness, the perfection, the holiness of Jesus himself so that God looks at us. He doesn't see our sin. It's still there. But he looks at us, and it's as if we have never sinned or been a sinner. God sees the righteousness of Jesus in us. And we are blessed with new life. Dead in sin. That describes us. We read that from Romans. And alive to God in Jesus Christ. That's the second benefit of his resurrection. And the third benefit... Our bodies will also someday, like Christ, be raised from the dead. Now, I need to make a correction here. Most people think that the end of life, the purpose of life, the end all, the most important thing, is that we get to be with Jesus after we die. No. No. The most important thing is that we are going to be with Jesus in the flesh. Right now, what is in heaven? Spirits. No bodies except for Jesus. Probably Elijah and Enoch too. But all of our friends or parents or others who have died before us, they're spirits. That's not the purpose of life. To be a spirit with Jesus. Rather, to be body and spirit together with Jesus. To have our bodies raised. We've been looking at Easter's foot race, and I can't invite you to run the race that was run by Peter and John. I can't invite you to run to the tomb. I can't invite you to see the linen cloths. I can't invite you to see that the grave is empty. But I can invite you to stand in the victor circle. How? By being like John. By having faith. By having faith. Not sight. Faith that he has risen. He has risen indeed. Let us pray.